afternoon, everybody. Um, today I want to talk to you about one of Jesus' many miracles. As we're reading the scripture, try to envision yourself there. So if you want to open up your Bibles, uh, John 5, 1. We're going to be uh, going through 1 through 15. I'm going to be reading from the NIV. So, um, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate Pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid, invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else gets down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up! Pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up the mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. So first of all, depending on the version of the Bible that you have, um, we are missing verse 4 um, in NIV, but I think we were missing 3 for some reason here. But um, 4 um, says, From time to time an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. Well, this is a myth. Um, but wouldn't it be funny? Uh, my mind went there. It would be like Jesus, when he was a child or something, he went into the pool and stirred the water, and then there was a blessing of somebody getting healed. And so then everybody thought, oh, it's angels or something. But that's where my mind went. Anyway, I guess... Um, um, so, have you ever, like God, said, oh, he isn't healing me? Maybe that's how the person with a disability felt who had been ill for 38 years. That's practically a lifetime of being down on the ground. Enough time to convince us that God doesn't see us, doesn't know our situation, and basically doesn't care. Have you been there? If so, maybe this story told by the Apostle John can lift your eyes to see a different perspective. So in verse 1, it says, you know, sometimes later Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Well, I guess John doesn't think of it as important to tell what Jewish festival it was and how much time had elapsed from the previous chapters. In verse 2, now there in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. You know, the setting is at a pool. And Bethesda, which means house of mercy, that is why you will see a lot of hospitals' names called Bethesda. So John wants us to note that the pool is next to the sheep gate, which was the gate sacrificial where they sacrificed lambs and brought them through there. As the story unfolds, John is creating a picture of contrast between the rituals of sacrifice along with the superstitious waters of healing with Jesus himself, who is both our true sacrifice and our living water. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. 
One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Can you just imagine how many people at this festival there were and how many people were in this area? We are being introduced, though, to our poor cast-down soul as one man who was among many invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. This description of disabled people serves as a rather pugnant pointer to life in this fallen world. This refers to a life without direction, a life with distortion and pain, and ultimately a life that is hopeless. Like this one man, we can find ourselves among many people with disabilities, people who are paralyzed and unable to find any healing, or wholeness for that matter. We can feel there is no one to help us when we forget that we are made to walk with the Lord. So verse 6 says, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to be made well? When I was reading this passage, I guess it reminded me, as a young child, um, I went to a school named Sunbeam for crippled children. Um, I went there from the first to fifth grade, and there was all these children who were disabled. Um, they were, you know, had different disabilities. Uh, some couldn't walk. They were in wheelchairs. Uh, some were paralyzed from the waist down. Some had uh, where they couldn't talk right. Um, so to that, you know, I mean, um, uh, an invalid for 38 years, that's, that's a lot of years to be, you know, down on the ground day in and day out. So the first thing that we see Jesus do is he takes notice of this man. He, uh, you know, he's lying there and he also knows that he's been there a long, long time. So why does he pick this man? I mean, I think Jesus wanted to show him mercy in a place of misery. No matter what our lifelong experience has been, the Father sees us and he knows each of our situations. It's out of this deep personal knowing, Jesus asked the man the question, do you want to be made well? Why do you think Jesus asked this question? I mean, you know, why do you think, don't you think that maybe he just healed him? But nope, he asked the question. But of course he wants to be made well. I mean, who doesn't want to be made well? But good questions are grounded in personal awareness. Jesus must have known that this man would need to wrestle with that question. 38 years of anything is a lot of undoing. The man's healing would amount to a whole new life of change for him. No one would have to bring him to the pool to be healed. He would have to take care and feed himself. Was he ready to start showing, showing personal responsibility? Was he ready to stop depending on others? Was he ready to enter, enter society in a new way? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no way to help, no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. The man's answer didn't tell us if he wanted to be made well. But it did tell us that he had been trying to make himself well for a very, very long time. His description of all the reasons he couldn't make it to the pool was placing blame on others who refused to help him. Not my fault. No one cares to help me. Was he feeling sorry for himself? Did he want sympathy because he was sick? Was he comfortable in this situation? Did he have victim mentality? Being paralyzed and unable to move or do anything for himself, the man wouldn't, would have never, no longer felt a useful or functioning part of society. We can see that he could easily have felt like an outcast. But why didn't he have someone place him in the edge of the pool so that someone could roll him right over as soon as the water stirred? I mean, being there 38 years, you would think that, you know, he would think of this. I mean, doesn't it say God helps those who help themselves? Oh, well, not in the Bible. 
that's part of uh, Ben Franklin attribute. Uh, it was attributed to Ben Franklin. Anyway, when you can't live up to the program, and you never can, you can always look down at others. It's easy to put the responsibility elsewhere. To blame others to get attention off ourselves. Jesus knew this about this man, and he knows this about us. And his response is one of grace. In um, chapter or, um, 8, then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up the mat and walked. Here's a man who has been let down for 38 years. This was a man who was unable to stand up, and Jesus' response to him is a powerful word of grace. Stand up. Take your mat and walk. These weren't empty words. They were words of power that created a new reality. The man only needed to believe and to respond. Jesus gave him legs to stand on and told him to take the mat home. He no longer needed his a mat to protect him from the ground. He no longer needed to wait for others to take care of him. His healing was complete. This man must have felt something go through his body to have listened to the stranger in front of him that commanded him to pick up his mat and walk. Would we do that? We probably would have thought Jesus was crazy to think after 38 years I'm going to walk just by saying you are healed. Would we be ready for that miracle? But this scripture shows us a different type of miracle. This man didn't go to Jesus or isn't asking Jesus to be healed. Jesus comes to him and then slips away quickly. This man doesn't even know who Jesus is or has any faith that he will be healed. In other scriptures of the Bible, Jesus healed because the people had faith. They came to him. So, for example, Luke 8, 43-48, Jesus cured a woman of an issue of blood by the touch of Jesus' garment. He said, then, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Jesus also opened up the eyes of two blind men in Matthew 9, 27 through 31. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. In Matthew 9, 1 through 8, Jesus also cured another paralyzed man. But this one was a little different. Uh, it says, some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. God offers opportunities to heal for even those who don't even know him or even believe in him. Even when we are moaners and whiners and dwell in pity, complain, God heals apart from faith and obedience because he wants to work in our lives. He wants to change our lifestyle of living. So, do you want to be made well? The story doesn't end here. In this story, we are given this little twist to aid us in our understanding of what the Sabbath rest is all about. Here, on the Sabbath day, Jesus tells the man to pick up his mat and walk. He wasn't trying to goad any of the uh, religious leaders. He was trying to help this man and us to understand that resting in him is not lying around all day long. Oh, where's the rest of it? I guess that's it. Um, I guess I don't have the rest. Um, okay, um, I just wanted to... I guess my paperwork isn't all here. Um, anyway, from what I remember of the scriptures, um, Jesus wants to make us whole. So um, he um, has us go through things, and if we believe in him, he will make us whole. Um, we pray about it, and um, there was a scripture in Jeremiah which says that he will heal us in um, spirit and he will heal us in physical 
Um, so, and I'm sorry, I thought I had everything here, but I can't, pardon me? And community. So, um, let us pray. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, we come before you, dear Lord. Help us to trust in you. Heal us, dear Lord, and make us whole. Even through our sin, uh, just uh, we ask that um, you help us through those sins and, um, and just be there for us. In Jesus Christ's holy name, amen.